Climate change, the most significant threat to human existence of our time, actively wreaking havoc on coastlines and a planet as a whole. Perhaps no region of the world stands to suffer the phenomena's effects more than the countries of the Caribbean. Countries which ironically contribute the least to such emissions, assessments of the region report unmitigated disaster is eminent. That's this week on The Global African. I'm Bill Fletcher, thanks for joining us. The Caribbean and its 40 million inhabitants face unprecedented vulnerability due to climate change. In the Caribbean, 70% of its inhabitants live in coastal settlements and heavily rely on the fishing and tourism industry as means for survival. As shorelines disappear due to ferocious storm surges and sea levels rise, transforming the geography of these small islands, the people of the Caribbean stand to suffer epic economic and social costs. 110,000 people stand to be displaced, and some 150 multi-million dollar resorts could be lost. Let's be clear, these are not predictions for the distant future. According to some models, this could occur in 20 years. Today on The Global African, we'll discuss the dynamics of climate change in the Caribbean, as well as the struggle for climate justice in the region. Joining us in our discussion about the climate crisis and the Caribbean is Ramon Bueno. Ramon Bueno is a consultant specializing in modeling potential economic impacts from climate changes. Previously, he worked for several years as a staff scientist in the former Client Economics Group at the Stockholm Environment Institute in Somerville, Massachusetts. He is also the author of the influential report entitled The Caribbean and Climate Change, The Costs of Inaction. Mr. Bueno, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Let me jump right into this with a somewhat morbid question. In reading <laughs> your report, I, I found myself thinking about Atlantis. I mean, it felt mm -hmm. like the entire Caribbean will become the next Atlantis. I mean, am I overstating the case? Well, you know, it, it's one of those things where um, it, it, it depends really on what ends up happening. And that was kind of the motivation behind the report. My, my colleagues uh, and I, there were several of us who worked on it together, which was to take a look at um, what's likely to happen if current trends continue and, and the projected under one of the business as usual type scenarios, projected increases in temperatures, sea level rise and, and storm intensities uh, hitting the area on the one hand and then and comparing that to a more moderate scenario that basically assumes that the world gets attacked together and starts doing things to, to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, and climate change. And even under that scenario, it, it's you know, there will be, you know, some sea level rise in the Caribbean, you know, maybe seven, eight inches instead of three plus feet, a uh, couple of degrees Fahrenheit increase average instead of, you know, eight or nine. And so even that scenario will have pretty strong impacts uh, on the islands. But the idea is to, to look at the difference between two possible worlds facing the Caribbean, say, in less than 100 years. And, and see how these islands, and you know, and they're very different. You know, it's easy to say the Caribbean, there are a lot of things that they have in common. They're surrounded by water, so sea level rise is, is not a, uh, it's not a uh, distant uh, phenomenon for them. Uh, but there are a lot of differences between the islands. Some of them are in the past of hurricanes on a regular basis. Um, others rarely, you know, like Aruba doesn't really, uh, Trinidad, Tobago, they don't really get too many hurricanes, whereas other islands, you know, say, Navis or, you know, many islands in the main path and the bigger islands like Cuba, a lot of territory. Um, so uh, those have a lot of exposure uh, to, to uh, storms, all have exposure to sea level rise. Some islands like uh, the Bahamas or others are pretty flat. You know, the highest elevations are not that high. Whereas, you know, the bigger islands, Dominican Republic, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, you know, they have a lot of interior a lot of mountains, so so they do have m many different vulnerabilities, and, and and then of course there's these socioeconomic vulnerabilities uh, and levels of preparedness that differentiate islands as well. So uh, so so we wanted to capture some of the intricacies and and the differences between 
how the islands are likely to be affected. But the bottom line is nobody gets away. Uh, if things don't improve uh, in terms of the world getting attacked together uh, and dealing with this issue, uh, nobody gets away easy from this. Uh, some islands that are richer and more developed, like Puerto Rico, uh, as a percent of their economy, it stand to suffer less. But it's still, uh, as an absolute amount, it, it, it means a lot of recurring damages uh, on an annual basis. Uh, so that's kind of what we were trying to get at. And, and you're right. I mean, it, it can seem like a grim picture, especially for islands that depend heavily on, on things like tourism, uh, or who are very flat or in the, in the path of hurricanes or very poor, like Haiti, or, you know, that if you get hit by repeated uh, national disasters, it just never quite can get out from under. Uh, so so mm. that, that is a grim picture. For those that are in denial of climate change, that it exists at all or, or whatever, uh, could you just give an, a couple of examples of the impact of climate change and emissions and what's happening in the Caribbean? You know, it's one thing for people to say, look, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, exactly when and so on. But, you know, even the scientists have, you know, there's levels of uncertainty. But if you live in an island, uh, whether it's Grenada or, you know, there, there are many islands, pick, you know, whatever, that's in the path of hurricanes, uh, that's where the population lives, uh, uh, mostly within, you know, a mile of the coast, and depends on tourism recurring every year. And all of a sudden, you start entering decades uh, in the future, uh, in the not that distant future, where all of a sudden uh, the, the ocean is encroaching on the beaches and on, on the property along where, where the population is concentrated. Uh, there might be roads that are, might be the main roads. In, in Barbados, the main road is really along the coast. Uh, and now the storms become stronger. You have more damage. Uh, people stay away. So your, your economy starts going into a downward spiral. And uh, more and more of the nation's budgets start going towards just getting back from under uh, natural disasters. Uh, if that starts happening with, with more frequency, it's nothing, it's nothing to laugh at. I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, it becomes a... a serious problem and if it's happening in, a, in, in the entire area where many of your neighbors are undergoing the same kind of phenomenon um, you know it's uh, never mind the health of the population if, if temperature you know this is an area that's pretty hot year-round if temperatures on average start rising you know five eight ten degrees uh, the number of days above 90 95 degrees start going you know to becoming intolerable night times if you have a lot of elderly you know or, or people or children that have difficulty dealing with that, then again, it, it becomes a cycle that feeds on itself. Uh, uh, and, and, and unfortunately, the livelihood of the, of, of the people in, in those places can become, you know, very, very tough. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. And, and, and many islands are actually doing what they can. But unfortunately, the main driver of what's going to happen to them depends on the world community. Uh, getting its act together and acting in a timely manner to forestall the the worst of the of the scientific uh, projections. And again, the scientific projections aren't, aren't saying this is exactly what's going to happen by 2080, or, but they're they're indicating a range of things around a, a, a potentially very bad situation. And if if we start taking actions that that make a difference and start reducing emissions, going to a more cleaner uh, way of, uh, of producing our life, you know, our, our, our sustainable, uh, into a more sustainable life, the energy that is cleaner and not polluting. And we will we'll all gain uh, from a health perspective, but also primarily because these dangers will be alleviated. It won't be as, as, as bad as the forecasts uh, could be. You know, in, in your report and subsequent reports that have highlighted the, the same issue, uh, what one of the things that jumps out is how is the rest of the world responding? And specifically, to what extent are countries like the United States, Russia, and other places, other industrialized countries that have been the main perpetrators in global uh, emissions, to what extent mm -hmm. are they taking responsibility for this? Do you, do you have any sense of global policy changes that are underway? Yeah, that's that's a that, that is the the key question really and and depending on 
when you think about it, it can be very, uh, very sad, depressing, or, or occasionally a little bit more optimistic. Um, the big debate has been over the last several years between the more developed countries who say, oh, we need to do something, uh, but everybody else needs to be on board. And the developing countries, I mean, I'm simplifying, but it, it, it did have these two sides saying, wait a minute, you're the ones who in your development and your creation of industries have contributed most of the uh, greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere that are taking it, that are brought us to this situation. Uh, you have to go first, you have the money, you have to help us you know, get out of this. Um, and the other side of the developed countries have been, you know, and it is backed by, by a lot of analysis saying yes, but going forward, uh, even if we bring our emissions down to zero, the development in, in the greater part of the world, China, India, Africa, you know, Latin America, will overwhelm, uh, you know, the, the, the contributions that have been from the developed countries up to now. And, and they're, they're both true. So, uh, but the responsibility to act and to move first has to be with those who have a the, the historical uh, responsibility to for getting us here and b who have the resources so it really is in everyone's interest even in developed countries uh, interest in in coordinating the, the the needed research and investment to make sure that the developing world has an alternative that isn't the same one for developing the industry and commerce and so on in a way that uh isn't following the historic pattern, which is the more development there is, the greater consumption of energy, the greater greenhouse gases. So that, that that's something that is where the divorce needs to happen. And, you know, and countries are doing things, you know, some advanced countries are doing quite well, you know, in moving along those lines, you know, like Germany and Spain and the U.S. is taking some steps, not so much at the federal level, although now there seems to be a beginning of it. Uh, but there are a lot of regional initiatives, states and, and groups of states. Um, and, and even in, in the developing world, a lot of countries realize that, you know, China is, is the number one in, uh, 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 polluter in a way now that it's reached this, this level of economic uh, activity. But China is also one of the biggest investors in solar and wind and other energy technologies because they, they see what, what the future looks like and they know that they have to change that. So I think... It, you know, in, in international politics and policy, it's very complex. There's a lot of finger pointing for years and years. But I think uh, we're at the point where uh, studies show that every few years, every five years that we let go by pointing fingers, we really make it that much more costly and, and difficult down the line. Uh, and I think it's beginning to to sink in, there, you know, in the next year, the, the world community through the UN has, has set itself the deadline of 2015 to come up with a, a good agreement on how to proceed. There's a lot of skepticism because they haven't been able to do it in the past, but that's, it, it needs to happen. There is no, <laughs> there is no alternative. You know, as, as my, my, co my colleague, Frank Ackerman, who I used to work for, has written a book, Can We Afford the Future? And the question sounds silly, but it, it really is the question, right? Can we afford the future? Do we have a choice really? Well, that, that, that raises a very important question. What's the relationship then between addressing these issues, both globally as well as within the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and an alternative economic framework. There are industries that are beginning to see, you know, we can do quite well if we are the first movers into, into, these, uh, into these areas. And uh, so even in the traditional in energy industry, some people are hedging their bets and beginning to move into, into uh, healthier, cleaner technologies. But I think one of the interesting things along that way is that in the business community, there's a growing recognition in the investment world that uh, this whole issue of risky investments, you know, that at some point there's a growing realization that if, just because you own a, a huge amount of uh, reserves of oil and coal and all that, uh, as the world consensus changes it, towards leaving those on the ground, on burn, on, on process, uh, if you keep buying and, and and holding onto these assets, they may become what's called, you know, stranded assets. You're gonna, to, so there's a growing pressure in the business investment community from many groups. Uh, there's one in Boston series that does a lot of work in that to, to highlight that um, at some point, even from a financial, even if you're the, the, the purest capitalist in the world, from the financial perspective, those are gonna be considered risky investments. Um, 
there's a study that just came out by an organization called Risky Business, looking at the potential damages and costs to the U.S. economy. And, and basically, and these are you know people who have led the financial world: Bloomberg, you know, uh, Rubin, uh, Paulson. These are people who have led our, our, our government in these areas and, and and private industry. And they're saying this is this is not you know this is not some uh, fringe activists saying one thing or another. Uh, this is this is real. This is a real threat, and 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 so I think we're going to see a transition. Uh, the question is how how quickly and and it can happen. And, and I think people being involved and, and and educated and and actively politically is an important part. Communities, you know, have an impact if they're mobilized, if they're participating, and holding their representatives accountable. Ramon Bueno, thank you very much for this uh, discussion. It's clear that we're going to have to do a lot more than keep our fingers crossed if we're going to prevent another Atlantis to emerge in the Caribbean and with other island nations. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you very much for joining us on this segment of The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. We'll be back in a moment. Joining us as we engage in this discussion about climate change and the impact on the Caribbean are two guests, uh, Ms. Stina Herberg and Empress Olufunmi Jacobs. Uh, Stina Herberg is an activist working towards sustainability and poverty eradication. She's the current principal at the Richmond Vale Academy in St. Vincent in the Caribbean. Empress Modubi Olufunmi Jacobs is a Haitian-born urban environmental educator and leader in the Universal Rastafari movement in St. Vincent, leading tree planting actions as well as community gardening. Welcome very much, Ms. Sternberg and Empress Olufunmi Jacobs. Thank you. Thank you. We're glad to be here. It's our pleasure. Could you tell us a little bit about the project that, uh, that you all are working on? What, what sort of work that you're conducting? Well, the um, St. Vincent Climate Compliance Conference, we initiated in 2012 due to all the new knowledge that we had gained about climate change and that we actually really need to take action. So from the academy, we will always be a small group and then we join with a big group, for example, groups that uh, Empress is representing. So what we did the first year, because a lot of people in St. Vincent, they know the climate is changing. Not everybody knows why, but they really know it's changing because it's striking us every year. So we thought we'll have to get ready. Then to get people on board, we started to mobilize many people to pick up trash, which was the environmental problem they could easily identify. So we went through rivers, streets, beaches, with school children, all kinds of people, and we picked up about 10 tons of trash, put that to the landfill. Then we have furthered into making a lot of tree planting actions and cooperating with organizations who do community gardens, besides that we're doing a lot of gardening here at the academy. But the tree planting, we plant 10,000 trees and we're about to plant another 15,000 trees this year, also in, um, with an organization that's organizing the Olympic Games in tree planting. What has been the response of people in St. Vincent to to your initiatives? Well, I think the response has been actually a little bit over our way over our expectation because what we started out doing, because when you start a program like this, how do you actually go about it? So we went out in the villages nearby and we talked to 250 people that we call Let's Talk Green. A lot of people came, a lot of people got into trying to understand why is the climate changing? Why can't I farm like I used to farm? And I think a lot of people have been taking it on very, very well. Also, people have been really easy to mobilize to plant trees. And I think that's also a sign that people in this country, they are ready, really ready to make this island green or a climate compliant island. Of course, there's a lot to do, but we are really on the way. So I think the response has been great. Was St. Vincent deforested? Well, there's some deforestation, yes but not to the extent where it's uh, really detrimental, but we do have the problem of deforestation. And um, a lot of the, 
it, it's tied to having to do with land management and access to land uh, and farming. So because also they're building a lot of houses and some of some of that deforestation has to do with that too, placing people in, in homes and so on. What, what sort of response have you gotten from uh, political officials in the government? Yeah, well, as a long-term, what is a life activist, you can get politicians on board, but it's very important for groups like us to understand that a lot of initi initiation of projects and implementations comes from people. Uh, and uh, our challenge has been to find who in the government we can work with. And there is a lot of very passionate individuals in the government who wants to have a green and clean nation. And then it's our challenge to find out how do we work together? What do we do together? And we have this year, it's only our second year into this 10 year program. I would say that the response from the politicians and the government is really picking up and we really appreciate that. For example, the Ministry of Agriculture have just launched one a new tree planting campaign together with us. And we've had the initial meetings with the Ministry of Health and Environment. And they, we are getting on board their meetings and so on. So I would say it's a good progress, but it's good to realize that if the groups out there want to do something, you got to get started because very often the politicians don't start. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Stina that it, it is the peop, it's people power that's going to help change um, this trend of global warming and climate change. For example, we have we have laws here against dumping, yet we don't have the resources to enforce those laws. So um, waste management has been a big problem for us here. And we're looking at ways in which we can manage waste. So we're suggesting things like recycling uh, of, of particularly the plastics and probably banning them too. Uh, finding alternative sources um, to those types of uh, petro petrochemical products. Um, the Rastafari community has been strong and pushing for the legalization of hemp here because we see a great potential in the hemp industry in terms of providing alternative, uh, uh, alternative sources of fuel, alternative sources of, of uh, medicine, alternative sources in terms of clothing, food it's an entire industry as we can see with the united states legalizing um that industry for particular medicinal use and so on well we're pushing for the total legalization in terms of industrializing it and having it in a way that it's it, it, it makes an impact on the environment a positive impact not a negative impact as it's doing right now being an illegal plant the uh the lessons that you've learned in St. Vincent, are they applicable in other parts of the Caribbean? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, this is because what we're doing, it's no magic, you know. Education is very important to get people on board. So I think that people could come and study with us in St. Vincent if they find inspiration here, bring that back home. We are developing different study materials. And then we are developing, for example, like nurseries uh, so that we're not developing it, it's already developed, but we use all low cost local solutions. And to start to clean up, you can always, I think you can nearly always get the local supermarket to donate you some plastic bags. And it is really to get going. And at the academy here, we are training people from the Caribbean and from around the world to become environmental activists. So people could come from all the different countries in the Caribbean, study and take action here at the Academy and bring that right home. Thank you very much, both of you, uh, for sharing this time with us and, and helping to give not just a presentation of the problems, but some incredibly exciting responses that people can undertake in, in re uh, reacting to this climate crisis that could undermine the Caribbean and, in fact, the planet as a whole. Thank you both very much. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. We'll look for you next time. <laughs>